A lot of times when marketers are setting up their email campaigns, they focus a lot of their time and energy on what's in the email, the creative, uh, the offer, things like that. In email, personalization is a huge reason why an email performs well. You may not be able to put a smiley face emoji in your subject line. You may have brand guidelines, and strict rules and things like that. But there are other ways to stand out. They think that the reason that their email performance is not working is because maybe they're sending too much. When the opposite is usually true. Welcome to the Growth Genius Series brought to you by DMA Asia and InfiDigit. My name is Shelly and I'm your host. Today our guest speaker is Jay Schwedelson, founder of SubjectLine.com, the leading free subject line rating tool ranked in the top 1% of all websites worldwide. Jay is also the president and CEO of World Data Group, a multi-brand marketing services company whose portfolio includes subjectline.com, Outcome Media, and Guru Events, which puts on the Guru Conference, the world's largest email marketing event. Schwederson has been named to Crane's top 100 industry leaders for 10 consecutive years. A very warm welcome, Jay. Hi, thanks for having me. It's excited to be here. Great. To start with, please tell us a little about you, your company, and your role to our viewers and listeners. Yeah, sure. So I've been uh, in the marketing world for about 25 years. I have an agency, which is called Outcome Media, about 100 people or so. We help brands, both business and consumer marketers, with their demand generation efforts. Separate from that, as you mentioned, we put on a conference. It's free. Uh, it's about email marketing. It's called Guru Conference. You can go to guruconference.com. And last year, we had 13,000 people that signed on board for the event. And it's two days, 30 speakers, everything you ever want to know about email. So it's totally free and I would recommend you you checking that out. So that's what I do. Wow, that's very interesting. I've never seen anybody organizing a free conference. So so that's very interesting to know. And yes. uh, so about subject line, I'm very keen to know more about that. So what are some hot trends you're seeing with subject line right now? Any tips for crafting a subject line that will increase open rates? Yeah, so a lot of times when marketers are setting up their email campaigns, they focus a lot of their time and energy on what's in the email, the creative, uh, the offer, things like that. When in reality, if they don't spend time on their subject line and they don't get their email open, then what's the difference? Really, what, what matters? Who cares what's inside your email if you can't get it open? So the subject line is really, really, really important. A few things to think about that are working right now for subject lines is first off, whatever is the most important part of your subject line has to be at the very start, right? If you have an offer, you know, two days left or 24 hours only, or, you know, you want somebody to register for something like save my spot, that needs to be said at the very start of the subject line because nobody's actually going to read the second half of your subject line. And at that very start, there are things that you could do literally in the first character or two that will actually dramatically increase how many people are opening every emails. For example, putting a number to start your subject line you know, the seven latest trends in marketing. Actually, the number being the first thing your subject line will actually give you a boost in engagement because it stands out a little bit more. An emoji to start at the beginning of your subject line, whether you're a business marketer or a consumer marketer, at the very start, that'll increase uh, the number of people opening up your emails. Capitalizing the first word of your subject line will increase the number of people opening up your emails. So little things add up to a big difference. And it's all about the start of your subject line. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, like putting a number, emoji, or capital words. Wow, interesting. So I want to talk about now personalization. We all know that personalization is a necessity, but many aren't sure how to execute beyond the usual hello and first name. So, yeah. you know, does personalization matter? If yes, then what are the tactical ways to start implementing personalized content? You know, in email, personalization is a huge reason why an email performs well. And a lot of people think that when we talk about personalization, you're think you're talking about, let's say in the subject line again, you would say J comma, check out whatever. And they think personalization is just the person's name, let's say in the subject line. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Let's say you want to always tell the person 
who they are as fast as you can. Meaning in the subject line, let's say somebody just bought a home. This is just for new homeowners. Okay. Uh, this is for people who love fishing for new grandparents, right? For people that live in the Chicago area in the subject line, the sooner that you could tell the person who they are, whether it's by their interest, uh, their geography, the stage in life, you know, are you a new parent? That gets a dramatic increase in people opening up your emails because like, Ooh, mm -hmm. that's for me. But on the business side, also, if you got an email and it says just for marketers, you're like, Oh, I'm a marketer. I need to open that up. Right. Or you put it in the subject line, the actual name of the company that you're emailing to. Right. So it says something like is outcome media at risk. Uh oh, I'm outcome media. I need to open <laughs> that up. So yeah. personalization can go well beyond somebody's name. It could be their interest. It could be their job function. It could be their company. It could be the stage in life. And the sooner that you tell somebody who they are and you let them know that the email that you're sending is not for everybody, but it's for you, uh, it works incredibly well. So much so that even if you did none of what I just said and you just put in the subject line just for you, literally writing just for you, people, whether it's subconscious or not, people get excited about the fact that, wait a minute, this email is not for everybody. It's for me. And that does really, really well. Yeah, very interesting. So my another question is that how do you craft an email on uninteresting subject or continue conversation with an uninterested customer? You know that a lot of us are in, let's call it a boring industry. Okay, maybe you're in a regulated industry. Maybe you're in, you know, healthcare or finance or government or things like that. And you think that you have to be very dry, right? That you have to be sort of boring in the way that you are marketing. The most important thing we have to realize is that we're all people. At the end of the day, we're people. We all react to the same things. Now, you may not, let's say you're marketing to somebody in the financial services category and the business to business side, you may not be able to put a smiley face emoji in your subject line. You may have brand guidelines and strict rules and things like that, but there are other ways to stand out. Okay. There are ways to stand out that can still be a conservative marketing technique. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you are promoting a webinar. Okay. When you send out that email in that subject line, for example, you could start your subject line and use brackets and write in the brackets. You could write, save my spot. So instead of writing webinar or register, you write, save my spot. And you say the, the five latest trends in, you know, uh, financial reporting, all of a sudden you're getting a little bit of excitement. Ooh, save my spot. It's mm -hmm. not being boring and saying register, right. And you're getting people a little bit excited about what they're doing inside the email the mistake that most marketers do is that they don't do enough with their call to action buttons the buttons that are actually in the email getting people to click through and go to the site they think that if it needs to say something like download or register mm. or buy now when those call to action buttons are critical they're critical in getting hard offers offers that are difficult to convert uh, they're critical elements to getting those people to the destination page, the landing page. So instead of saying things like download, okay, if you're promoting a piece of content, you want to say, get my free report, okay, or I want in or save my spot, things that are more active, that are more interesting. And if it's a consumer offer, instead of just saying register, sign up, it is uh, get my free trial, start my 30 day free trial. Whatever it is that you're promoting, you can make that call to action button more exciting. Um, and that helps a lot with offers that are a little bit boring. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So my next question is very basic, but we all want to know that what are the most ideal days and frequencies for sending email? That's a great question. Ironically, people think that they're sending too much email. They think that the reason that their email performance is not working is because maybe they're sending too much when the opposite is usually true for two reasons. Number one, the way that you stay in somebody's inbox versus the junk folder. And by the way, about 20% of all email goes to the junk folder. doesn't matter if you're Amazon, uh, the NFL, Salesforce, uh, Google, 20% of all emails going to go to the junk folder. So if you see some email go to the junk folder, don't lose your mind. It happens with every marketer for a hundred different reasons. 
Okay, so it's important when we're talking about how often you're sending, the reason that you stay in somebody's inbox rather than a junk folder is about overall engagement. How often are people opening and clicking on your emails? If you don't send enough email, and of course the email needs to be relevant, it's gotta be good stuff. But if you don't send enough email, frequently enough, you won't be generating enough opens and click-throughs to warrant to keep you in that inbox. So ironically, if you don't send out enough, you have a greater likelihood of going to the junk folder. So you're not going to the junk folder because you're sending too much. You might be going to the junk folder because you're not sending enough. Now, that being said, how much is the right amount? Okay, how much is the right amount? And there's no exact number like send out twice a week or, or twice uh, every other day, whatnot. But if you're not sending out at least once a week, you're not even in the ballpark. Believe it or not, on average, consumer marketers send out four emails a week and business marketers send out three and a half emails a week on average. Okay. Now, so you're sitting there saying, whoa, I don't send out that much, but you probably do. Because one email might be a newsletter, another one might be an offer email, another one might be whatever, but that is what marketers are sending on average. So I encourage you to be stay as relevant as you can, send out relevant stuff, but you're probably not sending out nearly as much as you probably should be. Mm -hmm. But there are like, I have subscribed to some emails and uh, sometimes I get every day. Yeah. And it's so irritating. I'm like, why I'm getting every day an email because my inbox is full of <laughs> only their emails. You know, that's an interesting point because it's all about relevancy, right? If I sent you an email every day and I sent you one great idea every single day, you might look forward to that email. You might be like, oh, Jay's got great ideas. I can't wait to get his emails. Whereas uh, somebody else sends you an email every day and all it is promotional and it's garbage. You're like, why am I on this list? It's terrible. Frequency is about relevancy, right? You have the license to send out more when whatever it is that you are sending is relevant and people want to get it. So I could send you 10 emails a day if they were relevant and you like them. Uh, so the more relevant you are, the more uh, frequently that you can send your email. And that's kind of the direct correlation that exists. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. But are there any key components for getting an email opened and clicked? Are there? So there's different kinds of emails, right? So you have really two different rules, well, three different kinds of emails. There's transactional. You buy something, you get an automated email, right? That's over there. Then you have your newsletter. Okay. And then you have offer emails. So you really need to break those two buckets apart. And by the way, I encourage everyone to break their tracking apart too. Uh, when you talk about what is my open rate, the percentage of people opening up my emails, what is my click-through rate? Hmm. Look at all your emails in, together in aggregate and say, my emails get an average of a 25% open rate and a 3% click-through rate. You can't do that. You need to create buckets. My newsletter gets an average of 25% open rate and a 3% click-through rate. My offer emails that promote this type of offer get these metrics. This offer gets these types of metrics. You need to have different benchmarks for the different kinds of emails. But so for example, for your newsletter, a lot of people make the mistake. Newsletters are very hard. It's a lot of content to put together. It's a big pain to get newsletter content and you finally hit send, it goes out the door and you hope it did well. The mistake that marketers most often make is that they don't send it again. You should be sending your newsletter twice. You send it that first time, let's say on Tuesday, here's the newsletter for the week. And then you send it again on Thursday, you take to everyone who didn't open up the original email, you send it again saying, hey, subject line, I think you missed this and send it again because that newsletter takes a lot of time and effort to put together and a lot of times people will miss it. So sending your newsletter twice, okay, in the same week is a great idea to increase your open rate and your click-through rate on that piece of content that took you a long time to put together. And on offer-related emails, really make sure that you are using a sense of urgency. I don't care if you're a business marketer or a consumer marketer, you want to be able to tell the person there's two days left for this offer, time's running out, this is your last chance in the subject line. And even if you have no end of your offer, you want to say something like don't miss out in that subject line. Human nature is always about wanting the thing that may not be available in the future. So when it's an offer email, really try to push that, that sense of urgency. Right. So are there any major pitfalls to avoid? So things to avoid, 
Uh, obviously, you don't want to be, you don't want to send something that's not true. Okay. There are certain words that might get you a really, a lot of people to open, but there are words I would avoid. So for example, things like urgent. I just talked about urgency, but you don't want to say something's urgent, right? Or alert. You only want to be alerted if your bank account gets compromised. It's urgent is like, you know, somebody's going to the hospital. That's urgent. You know, you're promoting your offer. It's not urgent. It's not an alert. And that upsets people, right? That upsets people and that gets people to unsubscribe. The other thing that gets people unsubscribe is when you personalize with their last name. For some reason, we're okay when we say J comma blah, blah, blah. But if I saw J Schwedelson comma blah, 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 we see spam complaints go up a lot, right? So little things like this are really important. Make sure that you're not upsetting the person that you are marketing to. Hmm. Hmm. Wait. So I also wanted to ask you that, uh, are there any powerful metrics for the email marketing other than open and click? First off, creating your own benchmarks are really important. A lot of times people say to me, well, what's the industry average? I'm in the automotive industry. I'm in the financial services. I'm in healthcare. I'm in business to business uh, technology. What is the industry average for, you know, opens or clicks or response rate or whatever? And that drives me crazy because mm -hmm. it means nothing. It means nothing. What you need to do is you want to create benchmarks for your own performance. Okay. You want to benchmark everything that you're doing. So when you send out on a Monday, your newsletter, and you have, what is your deliverability rate? 99%. What is my open rate? What is my click through rate? That's your newsletter. You don't really have an offer when you do have an offer. Okay. This is where the metrics go beyond the opens and the clicks, right? They go to your destination page. The game on the destination page, let's say you're promoting a webinar or some sort of piece of content, or you're giving out a coupon, the consumer side, what is your abandon rate? What is the percentage of people that get to your destination page that don't fill out? And that's a critical metric because there's a lot that you could do on that destination page, whatever pages that you're taking them to that you could do on that page to significantly increase the number of people that are signing up. So what can you do? Number one, when you're promoting an offer, I don't care if it's consumer or business, you want them to do something, buy something, download something, register for something. When they get to that page, what is on that page? Is there a navigation bar uh, where they can click off and go to another part of your site, which is horrible to do. You want everything on that page to be about that offer that they can't leave, that they're sort of trapped. They click through and now they can only do that thing. So you want to limit any click throughs going anywhere else. And when you have all those fields, you're asking them to fill out. Do you need every one of those fields? Every additional must fill field required field on your landing page. Okay. You're going to lose about 8% of your registrants. So you want to think about every single thing that you're asking somebody because that destination page is really important. And one other little trick that does really well is you send out your email and it has a big hero image in it, right? There's a picture of something. When they click through and they go to that destination page, what you want to do is you want to have that same image, the same hero image that's in your email. You want to have it front and center on your destination page because it makes people feel comfortable. It's subconscious, but people feel good saying, oh, I was interested in this thing over here. I clicked on it. This is I'm in the right place. I'm in the right place. I'm going to do the thing they asked me to do. Having the same primary image on your email and your destination page significantly increases your performance. But back to your question really digging into the data on your destination page and when people are falling off and why is going to be a big difference maker in terms of your overall response rate. Okay. Great. Very good points. I also wanted to ask you a few about few campaigns, which you can share with us any of your successful email campaign example or anyone done by anyone else, which you admire. Yeah. So my company on behalf of our clients, we handle six, billion email messages a year. That's a lot of email and we see a lot of good and we see a lot of bad and I sign up for everything. I really do encourage marketers instead of looking at your inbox as, Oh, I get so much spam. Oh, my inbox is filled with so much garbage. Right? Yeah. It really, to me is I sign up for everything because when you get an email, let's say you get an email from Apple. Okay. Apple is the biggest company in the world, most valuable company in the world. When they send you an email, Apple is literally giving you a marketing gift. What they're saying to you is, 
here is the latest marketing that we have, the best that we can do, and we're giving it to you for free. Every best practice that we could think of, everything we can come up with, the timing, the creative, the subject line, the from address, everything, here it is for you, marketer, in your inbox, it's a gift. And that is the way I look at every email from all the different brands that I get. Mm -hmm. Okay, because they're not just sending it out by accident. It wasn't like, oh yeah, just send it out, who cares? No, this has been thought about, approved by legal, approved by everybody. And so to analyze every little piece of it is so valuable. And there are some marketers that really go over the top that I think are wild. So for example, Wayfair. Sign up for Wayfair's emails. Domino's, the pizza place. Sign up for Domino's emails. Why do I bring up those organizations? Because they go further than almost any other marketer. You'll see them try things in their, in their subject lines and their from address and in their body copy. They'll use 400 emojis. And I'm not telling you to copy what they're doing, but I think it's really important to see how far extreme marketers go with some of the tactics that they try, because then you'll feel better about trying some of the smaller things. A lot of times marketers get scared, like, oh, I can't do that. You know, it's too much. So when you see these other big brands going crazy, doing all sorts of stuff, you're like, all right, if they're going to do that, I can do this. And so that's, that's important. On the business side, I think Salesforce does a really good job trying to use some of the latest uh, best practices and trends. So yeah, so I would sign up for, for all those emails. Great. My next segment is on trends. So what are the top three local and global trends in email marketing to watch for? Yeah, email marketing obviously continues to evolve. I would say one of the biggest things is a change over the last few years in terms of what's called spam trigger words. Okay, so if you went back, uh, even now, if you were to Google spam trigger words or spammy words, you will find hundreds of articles telling you words that you need to avoid using in your subject line or your body copy because if you use them it might trigger you to go to the junk folder. the words like you know free or an exclamation point or things like that that information is really old information that's information from years ago that's how filtering and why you went to the junk folder used to be that's not the case anymore you don't go to the junk folder to the spam folder 99 percent of the time because of the content, because of the words that you're writing, because of the symbols that you're using, you're going to the spam and junk folder because of your technical sending reputation. And the reason I talk about this as a trend is that a lot of times when you see best practice information, especially about email marketing, it's not really current, even though it might be an article written today, it's based on legacy information. So this idea of spam trigger words or spammy words really isn't a thing anymore. And yet you'll see articles about it every single day. So I would encourage you to, you know, when you see, when you hear anything that's like taboo, oh, we could never do this with email because we heard, you know, blah, blah, blah. Those are likely the things that you need to try first because that's based on information from five years ago, 10 years ago. So that to me is one of the biggest changes uh, in email marketing. Mm -hmm. Great. So what would you recommend to the marketeers to do in the near future and, you know, in the horizon of three to five years uh, on email marketing? Well, I think email is more and more important than ever, not just because I do a lot of this for my job. And I'll tell you why. You could build up a huge following on LinkedIn or a big following on Instagram or TikTok or whatever. But in any moment, those platforms could snap their fingers, change their algorithms. Mm. And when you go to share your content, it's throttled back. You know, I like to look at that as rented real estate rather than owned real estate. So all these social platforms, they're great, but you never really know where you stand and you never really can reach your entire audience of people that are, are they following you? You just can't with any one post, it doesn't work. That's not how the algorithms are set up. But with email, it's really owned. Right, you own that, you own that dialogue. You decide when everybody on your list gets something, what everybody on your list is going to see. And there's no algorithm that's going to stop you from communicating with that database. So focusing your efforts every and it takes time. It's a daily thing, right? Collecting that email address, like on your website, do you have a fixed position, something that doesn't go away on your website where someone could sign up for your newsletter? 
right? Are you doing pop-up contact captures where they go to your website or they leave your website says, hey, get our latest trends report, put in your email address or get 10% off, put in your email address. You know, when you do a social media post on LinkedIn, do you say also uh, sign up for my newsletter? Everywhere that you can, you want to be thinking about how to build your email list. And it takes time, but this idea of owned property versus rented property in terms of your, uh, your digital kind of uh, view is really, it's critical for marketers. Wow, great. So this brings us to our last segment in this episode. Tell us about any one passion you follow and how it helps you to elevate your profession. You know, I started uh, my own newsletter, not my company, me, it's called Scoop. And you could actually, uh, you could find my newsletter. If you go on LinkedIn and, and find me on my profile, you could sign up for my newsletter. But the reason I bring that up is that I decided a few years ago to start this newsletter. And instead of it being like a boring newsletter about just marketing stuff, I put in a few marketing ideas and then I share what I'm up to in my real life. You know, mm -hmm. I'll share uh, what's going on with my kids, what TV shows I'm watching, what I had for dinner last night. I share what I'm really doing and how I really feel about things. I mean, I don't get into politics or religion, just the basics. And I have found that by being as transparent as I can, by being as real as I can, I built up a much better relationship with all the different you know people in my business life. And so that's really been interesting to me to go further and further down that path. And my newsletters has grown exponentially because of this. And I get really high open rates and really great engagement. And what I've learned from this is we are living in a world where everything is, you know, we're not really together as much and people are working remotely. And everybody thinks that, you know, when you, something goes online, it has to be perfect. Right. Where in reality, the more real that we could be, you know, let's say you do a video you want to put on LinkedIn, pointing that camera at yourself on your phone does a lot better than standing in front of a green screen and making it all look all nice and pretty. And we live in this inauthentic world. So the more authentic we can be, I found it to be super engaging and also it's more fun for me. So I guess that's a passion of mine over the last few years is trying to get comfortable because it's very uncomfortable to get comfortable with being transparent about myself. So that's what I try to do. Wow, that's great. <laughs> Very interesting to know that uh, I will definitely like to check out your email. <laughs> okay, good, thank you. Okay. Where can our listeners and viewers find you and connect with you? Yeah, so um, number one, please connect with me on LinkedIn. I love being connected with everybody on LinkedIn. I share a lot of information uh, there. I have my own website separate from my companies. It's my name. It's jayschwedelson.com. So it's J-A-Y and then my name, Schwedelson, S-C-H-W-E-D-E-L-S-O-N.com. So jschwedelson.com. And you can sign up for my newsletter and all sorts of other stuff there. And I really do encourage everyone who, if you care about email marketing, this event is free. I would go to guruconference.com. It's really useful information. 30 speakers, two days. I think it's fun. So uh, yeah, so that's fun and it's free and why not? Great. Well, thank you so much, Jay, for your time today and wonderful insights into email marketing. Not only is email marketing cost effective, but its flexibility and ease of use makes it significant growth driver to bring ROI. I'm sure our listeners will take away actionable insight and start implementing. Thanks again. Sure thing. Great being here. Thank you. To all our viewers, thanks for listening. And please subscribe to our channel. If you like this episode, leave a rating and review. I'll see you next time with a new speaker. Till then, peace.